So welcome to this session on addressing the threat of marine and freshwater pollution from inadequate sanitation. This is a critical topic for the sanitation sector, for the environmental and the ecological sectors, and not to mention for the sustainability of the planet. So not much pressure on us then. Uh, my name is Martin Gamble. I'm a lead water and sanitation specialist at the World Bank and I'll be moderating this session today. The co-conveners who funded this session together with the World Bank are the Nature Conservancy and the University of Leeds. Who are also bringing their brain power and experiences uh, to us today, together with those of the Re Research Institutes of Sweden, University of California, Santa Barbara, and University of Hawaii, Manoa. Please follow the usual webinar protocols of muting your microphone when not speaking, and of using the pathable chat box and not the Zoom chat box to ask questions and make comments throughout. Our 60-minute session will comprise what we hope you'll find to be a set of compelling espresso presentations about the impact of inadequate sanitation on marine and freshwater environments, followed by a discussion with our esteemed panelists. So to kick us off, I'd like to first introduce and uh, hand the word to my colleague Nishta Mehta and introduce her. Nishta is a water supply and sanitation specialist at the World Bank, where she's worked on WASH projects in many regions and where she's now part of the bank's citywide inclusive sanitation core team, supporting urban sanitation interventions globally. She's a PhD in urban planning with a focus on infrastructure service delivery and over a decade of experience in the WASH sector. Nishta will present to us on safely managed sanitation and the environmental imperative. Over to you, Nishta. Thank you, Martin. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, so safe sanitation has co-benefits that extend far beyond the realm of public health, including direct ecosystem protection and pollution prevention. Safely managed sanitation across the sanitation service chain unquestionably contributes to environmental protection through reduction in pollution of soils, groundwater, waterways, seas, and ocean. It also helps to mitigate the adverse impacts of flooding. But the reality is different. We don't have safely managed sanitation everywhere. As this multi-city SFD, which covers 94 cities, shows, in most cities, sanitation is provided through a mix of on-site and off-site services with some open defecation. The most significant portions of unsafely managed excreta are contents of pits and tanks that are not emptied and are overflowing, leaking, or discharging into the environment, contents of pits and tanks that are emptied but not delivered to treatment, fecal sludge delivered to treatment but not treated, wastewater and sewers that is leaking and is not delivered to treatment, and wastewater that is delivered to treatment but not treated. As you can see, 66% of the waste from these 94 cities is ending up in the environment, in our groundwater, in our rivers, seas, and oceans, leading to severe consequences. To understand the complexity, it is important to see how integrated sanitation works. The green arrows represent an effective suite of urban sanitation services. However, overflowing pump stations, illegal fecal sludge dumping, and direct connection of pits and septic tanks to the stormwater drainage system, exacerbated by the accumulation of solid waste in the drainage system, leads to downstream pollution and flooding. Ineffective fecal sludge and sewage treatment and inadequately managed landfills add to this problem. In effect, all major urban waste streams get mixed up in practice and end up in our environment. In order to protect the environment, all these services must be managed together if they are to be effective. To give you a few examples of the consequences, I want to take you through a few photos. This is the Sea of Marmara in Turkey, which is dealing with an unprecedented amount of mucilage, which is in part due to unsafe wastewater and fecal slush discharge into the sea. This is River Ganga, where untreated wastewater and fecal sludge is affecting waste water quality, culture, health, and economics in the region. These are a few images from Lake Victoria, which is dealing with pollution from municipal sanitation waste, which impacts health, life, and economics in the region. These images really exemplify that protecting the environment is not possible without ensuring safely managed sanitation. We're going to hear a lot more about this from the other speakers. Thank you, and back to you, Martin. Thanks so much, Nishta, for setting the scene for us and for painting a sobering picture of why this theme is so important for freshwater and marine water pollution. If you have any questions or comments for Nishta or any of the other presenters, as I mentioned, please place them in the pathable chat box. 
We're now going to hear from Dr. Stephanie Weir of the Nature Conservancy. Stephanie is a marine scientist at TNC where her work focuses on improving the health of coastal habitats at the global scale. She's a self-proclaimed safe sanitation enthusiast, so she's in great company here today with us, and she's led the development of a new partnership bringing together organizations across sectors, focusing on reducing wastewater pollution in the ocean called the Ocean Sewage Alliance. Over to you, Stephanie, to give us an overview of the environmental impacts of ocean sewage pollution. Thank you, Martin. Um, I'm really excited to be here today for the chance to spotlight uh, the challenges that are surrounding wastewater pollution in coastal water. So let's get started in our, in our espresso. Next slide, please, Nishta. Okay, so for way too long, we have used the ocean as a solution for disposal of wastewater. Many cities, as Nisha was mentioning, have been designed to combine stormwater and sewer water so that rain events don't overwhelm treatment plants, ultimately discharging tens of trillions of gallons of sewage and stormwater into the ocean every year. An estimated 80% of our global wastewater is discharged untreated into the environment. The assumption has been, not surprisingly, that the ocean can handle it. We think the ocean can handle a lot. We know that. The fact is the ocean, and, 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 and people think that the ocean can treat the wastewater, but relying on that old adage, the solution to pollution is dilution. The ocean is not capable of managing all of the waste that humans are putting into it. So I would like to put an end to that today. And let me be very clear that our oceans and our environment in general can't handle it and in fact have been severely impacted by it. And it's time for us to put an end to it. So today I wanna to share a very brief overview of some of the impacts and mechanisms that are leading to the decline in key coastal habitats, some that are a little bit surprising for, for many. These are habitats on which billions of people depend. Next slide, please. So let's start with wetlands. Wetlands like temperate salt marshes or mangroves that you find in tropical areas are broadly understood to be very good natural filters. In fact, we dump untreated wastewater into these wetlands like it's our business. Unfortunately, because these wetlands are nutrient limited, there has been an assumption that adding more nitrogen and phosphorus to the system might even be beneficial to them, which has led to the common practice of wetlands being used in this way as natural filters, removing pollutants such as nitrogen and even pathogens so to the benefit of nearby habitats that are more sensitive like coral reefs. What we now know is that yes, these systems are nutrient limited, but they have their limits just like everything, right? So what happens is that the plants take up all the extra nutrients that they're being supplied through this runoff of wastewater and they shift their production from below ground roots, so they're putting all this energy into spreading out into the soil, um, to above ground shoots, right? So this leads someone to assume that the system is thriving because the grass is so tall and lush or the man mangrove canopy is so thick. But because the root systems are now underdeveloped and shallow, the plant no longer has a root system that can really support it, especially through the hard times. And we know that there are lots of hard times ahead with everything we're seeing now with our changing climate. In the case of salt marshes, they are more susceptible to erosion, sea level rise, and storm surge. And in the case of mangroves, they're more susceptible to drought and salinity stress. So losing these habitats has great consequences both to ocean health, they are hubs of productivity and essential nursery habitat, and a source of food and protection for all the little ocean critters, but also there, it's important for human well-being, offering some of the same benefits, food and importantly, coastal protection. These habitats make it possible for human communities to live in many coastal areas. And on top of all of that, they're now being appreciated as in really important for carbon storage. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk about coral reefs, my favorite topic. Okay, so coral reefs are in a different situation altogether. They are not nutrient limited habitats. In fact, they thrive in conditions where nutrients are low and they struggle when nutrients are added to the system. It is much more intuitive that wastewater pollution is problematic for reefs. And in fact, is one of the biggest 
threats they face along with overfishing and climate change. However, because wastewater pollution is generally invisible, very little is getting done to address it currently. Its presence is often only noticed because of the dramatic impacts we see on coral reefs, including disease, overgrowth of algae, as one famous coral reef scientist puts it, Jeremy Jackson, the rise of slime, it's just gross. But these impacts can also be masked by other threats. So this makes it even more difficult to tease apart. It's only recently that the science is catching up and clearly demonstrating that this is what, what has always been intuitive, basically, that we are losing reefs to wastewater pollution. This is happening to varying degrees in most places that have coral reefs and people, got to have people, as noted by the statistic on the slide. The negative effects are not just limited to increases in nutrients. We talk a lot about that, but there are other common household com wastewater components that are problematic as well, including pharmaceuticals, endocrine disruptors, and even human pathogens. There's a common disease in Caribbean corals, uh, white pox disease, that's caused by a human pathogen from sewage discharged into coastal waters. And if you just think about that for a moment, a pathogen from a terrestrial mammal is causing disease in a marine invertebrate. It's, it's just kind of crazy. Next slide. Two minutes, Stephanie. Okay, finally, fisheries. A driving force in many coastal economies providing food and jobs for billions of people across the planet. Again, a lot of assumptions have been made on the impacts of pollution on marine fish populations because of their ability to move and supposedly get out of the way of pollution. But recent science has shown us that coastal fish populations are extremely vulnerable to pollution in the larval, juvenile, and adult stages. Researchers are showing that this pollution can impact where fish choose to live, their ability to grow and reproduce, and their health in general. Diseased fish with deformities are showing up in areas with known sewage pollution and contaminants are being found in the tissues of juvenile fish living near tertiary treated sewage treatment plants they're discharging treated water. So they're getting contaminated from even treated water. The fish are just soaking up whatever is in, is in the water one way or another. We don't have a really good sense of the scope of this impact yet, given the novelty of the research, but we do know that even a limited scope could be disastrous for a fishery dependent community and economy. While this new information can be overwhelming, now we have a better sense of what's happening so we can do something about it. Next slide, I'm wrapping up Martin. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, to start, we are sharing this information in forums like this, but more importantly, we're coming together to figure out how we can work across sector to dispel this idea that the ocean is the solution to wastewater management. We have recently formed a new collaboration called the Ocean Sewage Alliance that Martin mentioned. It's not the sexiest name, but you get what we're thinking about. And we just launched in June and we have 22 partner organizations plus academic scientists and growing. Next slide. So you can find our website at oceansewagealliance.org and our follow our social accounts. And we are keen to connect with others with similar interests to work with us to fill the knowledge gaps, build partnerships, and find more sustainable and ocean-friendly ways to manage our wastewater. We will be building a knowledge hub over the coming months and we welcome you to follow, learn, or just join in and contribute. Thank you. Thanks so much, Stephanie, uh, for providing us with the perspective of marine and coastal ecology. I remember your explanation to me of roots versus shoots when we first met was a wake up call uh, as to how there are so many more dimensions of wastewater pollution than we in the sanitation sector are, are fully aware of. Thanks also for conceiving and spearheading the Ocean Sewage Alliance um, to help bring these different sectors together in pursuit of healthier seas. So if you have questions for Stephanie, please use the Pathable chat box. Our next speaker moving right on is Dr. Ben Halpin. Ben is a director of the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis and professor in the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management at UC Santa Barbara. He received his PhD in marine ecology, has published over 250 peer reviewed articles, was named one of the world's most influential scientific minds by Thomson Reuters and has collected a number of eminent awards. Ben will present to us on his global mapping of sewage pollution and coastal oceans. Over to you, Ben. Thanks so much, Martin, and everyone for joining today. It's, it's great to be here virtually. I wish we could be in person sometime in the near future, hopefully. And thanks to, to Nishta and, and Stephanie for setting the context. Uh, I, I want to build on that and um, look at how we can better understand where these sources of wastewater are coming from and where they are going into coastal waters and what that might mean for, for management and conservation of these coastal systems. Next slide. 
So as we saw from, from Nishta, you know, we, and we probably all know, wastewater can come from multiple different sources. It can be uh, treated sewage from um, wastewater systems. It can be in septic systems or, or uh, tanks and pits, or it can be direct input into the system. And understanding these sources is really important for understanding the solutions and pathways to solving the problem and mitigating the input from wastewater uh, nitrogen into coastal waters. Next slide. So what I want to do today is, um, with the study we've done, uh, answer the, the first three questions. The fourth one we can get to uh, in question and answer if you're interested, just in the interest of time, uh, we, we won't be able to get to it. But I want to know uh, first how much um, there is wastewater coming from human sewage uh, into coastal waters and what the contribution of that is. Importantly, then, where it is coming from on the land and which sources are contributing to that. And then, uh, so what? Where and how much of it is, is making it to coastal habitats and which are exposed to this wastewater input? That we, like a note here, we also look at the human health implications, but I'm not gonna cover that today. Next slide. So our approach for doing this was a modeling exercise informed by lots and lots of data on how wastewater is input into the system and then transported through the system into coastal waters. So we map where humans uh, live on the landscape and whether they're in um, urban or rural populations because the wastewater is often um, handled differently in these two contexts. Next. We then look at the protein consumption, the food that is eaten by different populations because this is uh, what contributes nitrogen in particular into wastewater. Most of protein is actually not uh, taken up by people and is contributed into, into wastewater as nitrogen. Next. We then map um, using statistics on how much of that uh, input is in sewer system, septic systems, or untreated direct input. Next. We can measure the distance to the watersheds and then how much of that is likely put into the, into the watersheds and then transported to the coastal areas. Next. And then we can look at both nitrogen and fecal indicator organisms in that water and then spread that into the coastal waters through a diffusion model to see how much of coastal habitats are exposed. So many steps, it's a modeling exercise, but informed by a lot of different data inputs that tell us what is likely going on. Next. So the first highlight result is of that, um, of the total nitrogen putting in, being put into coastal waters from agriculture, livestock, manure, and wastewater, Wastewater nitrogen is about 40% of the total that's coming from agriculture. So agriculture nitrogen runoff gets lots of attention in places like some of the large watersheds like Mississippi or the Danube because of so much agriculture happening in those watersheds. But the problem of wastewater is on equal magnitude and it's definitely something we need to be paying attention to. Next. So we can map that and we can see here what that looks like. This is the greens to blues are where it's coming from on the landscape and the yellows to purples are where it's ending up in the coastal waters. Next, we can zoom into a few places and you can start to see these plumes coming out of the large watersheds, the Ganges, the Danube and the Yangtze. Um, and from those maps, we can start to look at where these impacts are happening. Next. Two, minute, two minutes, Ben. So we now, for the 135,000 watersheds that we mapped, we can see that in fact, just 25 of those watersheds are contributing over half of the global wastewater nitrogen. These are the large watersheds, but they really show how concentrated the, the problem is and where some of the key areas for solutions might lie. Next slide. We can look at this by country as well. So this shows for each country how much of that wastewater input is coming from sewer treated systems, from septic systems, and from open defecation. You can see in some countries like China and India, the, the open contribution is substantial, where in other countries, it's mostly treated. Next. But we can do this for every country and see regional patterns and specific countries, which again helps focus our effort into thinking about where solutions might lie from a country to country perspective for addressing wastewater input. Next. Interestingly, as that, that figure showed, uh, you, uh, nearly half, about 40% of wastewater input globally is coming from septic and direct input. So about 60% is from sewer systems. In many countries, 
nearly 100% is coming from septic and direct systems. And so thinking about solutions for these countries is gonna be very different than those that are primarily on sewer systems. Next. And then finally, I wanna look at what this means for coastal habitats. Stephanie gave a really important uh, introduction to why we should care about these. I'm gonna look at coral reefs and seagrasses. Here we can see globally in the coral reefs, um, those uh, coral reefs that are being directly uh, exposed to um, wastewater input, that's the yellows. The few places where there's no wastewater impact, they're far from, from watershed outputs. And then the red ones are these top 2.5% where the, the impact is really high and they're spread across the globe. And these are the areas where a particular priority for mitigating wastewater input lies. Next. Similar view for seagrasses. Um, fewer in the, in the a smaller distribution of the high impact ones, but still a global impact. And of course, seagrasses are in temperate areas. So you see this spreading into other parts of the globe where this exposure is quite high. And then next. So what we found is that 58% of coral reefs are exposed and 88% of seagrasses are exposed. Now, now, our exercise was a modeling one. It doesn't account for some of the issues um, uh, about how well treatment is actually being done and um, how exposure might be uh, increased through advective currents that bring wastewater input into other coral reefs. But it gives us a really important baseline for understanding where uh, coastal habitats are being impacted and what are the sources of those impacts to um, coastal habitats from different land-based uh, inputs of wastewater. Next. So I hope I've given you a, an, an overview of where things sit and a, kind of a, a, a view and how we might think about prioritizing our strategies and the solutions for dealing with wastewater input. And then as Stephanie pointed out, it is a coastal marine issue uh, with important consequences. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, hopefully that's light at the end of the tunnel there in your last, your last um, image. Uh, it's a stark picture you painted, but thanks for introducing us to this important modeling and the analysis behind it, which allow us to understand the severity, the severity of marine pollution globally. And, and it's linked to, links to upstream freshwater pollution. Comments for um, Ben in the box as well, please. Right, moving right on, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Elizabeth Kavanstrom, who works with different aspects of sanitation system sustainability, with a special focus on safe reuse of nutrients in agriculture. She holds a PhD in wastewater engineering as a senior researcher at Research Institutes of Sweden and an adjunct professor in the Urban Water en Engineering Group at Luleå University of Technology. Over to you, Elizabeth, to tell us why tertiary wastewater treatment isn't enough. So thank you so much, Martin. Thank you for the opportunity of being here. Um, I'm going to build on what Ben just talked about, um, continuing, of course, with the nutrients. And next, please. Um, so we're a country of adequate sanitation, Sweden is, but we're still struggling with eutrophication, which Ben showed um, very well earlier. We have algal blooms occurring in our waters. And the question is, of course, how much are our wastewater treatment plants contributing to this problem? We're zooming in now on one little water body, <laughs> body in Sweden from Ben's larger picture. So next, please. We can look at Sweden's anthropogenic nutrient load to the Baltic proper, which is the part of the Baltic Sea that uh, Stockholm sits on. And um, you can see the different um, um, sectors here. So it's repetition is the mother of, of um, wisdom or, or learning. So I'm just repeating what Ben just said. Uh, in the Swedish context, uh, in, this, uh, in this part of the Baltic Sea, agriculture is the largest contributor of nutrients. Uh, but look at the second largest contributor. It's, it's our wastewater treatment plants. And mind you guys, these are all these treatment plants have nutrient removal processes in place, both for nitrogen and phosphorus. And still, this is how big our contribution is uh, from our sector. Um, so question is then, can you really say that this approach with tertiary nutrient removal is sustainable in an absolute term. Um, next, please. And actually, there's a water utility in Denmark, Van Center Syd, who has been looking into its absolute uh, environmental sustainability of its processes um, to understand more. Um, so next, please. Um, how they function. So what they've done is they have used the concept of planetary boundaries. And just to remind you guys, it's a way to try and quantify how humanity needs to behave 
to get boundaries within, within which we need to stay so we're not jeopardizing the stability of a number of earth functions. So this utility together with researchers, they were looking into uh, life cycle assessments of their services and comparing that to an assigned piece of these planetary boundaries. Next, please. And the result is a bit of a mixed bag in terms of absolute environmental sustainability and um, focusing only on the biogeochemical flows of phosphorus and nitrogen down to the bottom left of this um, picture. Um, the assigned piece of the planetary boundaries was transgressed by 16 times by this utility who is applying tertiary nutrient removal with very ambitious nitrogen and phosphorus effluent concentrations. Next, please. Um, so what to do then? Well, the, the authors of the article are talking about the fact it's not the wastewater treatment plant per se that is the problem, it's the flow, the massive flow of nutrients from societies into waters. So what can you do then? Next, please. Well, you can, um, you can either try and reduce the amount of nutrients coming into the wastewater treatment plant by manipulating people's diets. They said it's not so likely to happen. Next, please. Um, or you have to increase um, the number of treatment processes in your treatment plant. Next, please. But what it didn't talk about is the fact that you can do this differently. If you're in new urban areas, you can actually take this nutrient rich part of the wastewater, which is the black water where you find the pee and poo, and treat it separately. Keep it on land for, for reuse and agriculture. Keep it out of the big water flow. Next, please. And there's actually another water utility in southern Sweden doing exactly this. They're treating, they're collecting in grey water and black water and also organic kitchen waste separately for treatment in their very nice new uh, recovery plant where they maximize the recovery of nutrients, biogas, water and heat actually. Next please. But so what on a global level? Does this happen anywhere else but in this um, nice new urban development? Yes, the short answer is yes. There's a handful of Northern European cities with similar processes in place. Next, please. But still, so what in a development perspective, you might ask yourself. Next, please. And I would argue that we, irrespective of where we are in the world, the sector needs to change from thinking that Tertiary nutrient removal is the answer to nutrient management in our sector, to understanding we need to keep those flows separate and we need to go for full and safe reuse of nutrients and other resources. Next, please. And, and the most important thing to do there is to keep the nutrient flow separate from the larger water flow. And how you can do this differ, of course, depending on your context. But it's also important to remember in a city where you have low coverage of sewers in place, you can have uh, other possibilities to keep these flows separate than we do have in, in Northern Europe. And on-site solutions can be part of the, uh, of the approach. Next, please. And is there a possibility to collect urine separately? If yes, then you control the absolute bulk of nutrients in your wastewater. Next, please. And once you have this uh, um, nutrient-rich flow stream collected, we need to get our thinking caps on together with the farming community to produce more um, functioning um, uh, service delivery models for an attractive and safe reuse of, of uh, nutrients in the agriculture. Next, please. So what are we waiting for? Thank you, Elizabeth, thanks for bringing a stark yet refreshing perspective to the sanitation pollution challenge with some forward-looking thinking from Northern Europe on the issue, including us all having to eat less, but more seriously, um, you know, this issue of nutrient management, it's, it's a really important a term and a really important concept. Any comments for Elizabeth, Ben and the others, please put them in the pathable chat box. Um, last but not by no means least of our presenters is Professor Barbara Evans of the University of Leeds. Barbara holds the chair in public health engineering in the School of Civil Engineering at the University, um, where she leads a multidisciplinary team that works on wash services with a particular focus on urban sanitation. She previously worked at the World Bank for over 20 years and has lived and worked all over the world. She provides strategic advice to international development, uh, development agencies, foundations and governments, among others, and has won several prizes for her work in the sector. 
Barbara, over to you on to bring the on-site sanitation angle to this discussion. Yeah, thanks, Martin. And thanks to Elizabeth for teeing me up to talk a little bit about on-site and for Elizabeth in the chat for asking about freshwater bodies. So I just wanted to share some work which comes from the High Crystal Project, which is funded by uh, the UK government, is a huge collaboration with climate scientists in East Africa. Next slide, please. At one part of this project, we were interested to understand the interaction between climate change, uh, how that will increase flooding in East Africa, which we know is a big issue, and how that's going to change the way we think about sanitation. And in this particular project, we were really interested in assessing the likely future impact of flooding on sanitation failures. Next slide, please. Um, so I just want to walk you through this project a little bit to say how we assembled the data, but also the implications of this for uh, Lake Victoria and for interventions. Next slide. So it was a really, really transdisciplinary project. We had a lot of social science to work in communities to understand how people experienced floods and what happened to sanitation during flood events. Next. Uh, we had some very cool climate science, um, which I learned a lot from. I spent a lot of time with some very, very smart people and also a lot of downscaling to understand how rainfall patterns might change. Next slide. Um, we used some of our uh, climate science to create synthetic future rainfall events, which we used to run flood models. And we overlaid those with next. Um, next slide, please. We overlaid those with uh, sanitation mapping because Kampala has fabulous data on sanitation. Next slide, please. And taking all of that together, we were able to identify the intersection between uh, all of the different types of sanitation that existed in Kampala and increased flood risks in the future. And then we did a small piece of work on a one catchment. Next slide. This is McKinley, um, which is a catchment that flows down into the lake. And we were really interested to understand how uh, these future flooding events were going to increase the risk of disease outbreak and also coincidentally although it wasn't our original intention it allows us to map um, increased shock loading of nutrients into the lake next slide please so um, we did a lot of modeling we used the flood models to drive a, a performance model for our sanitation so we were able to estimate um, how much fecal waste would be washed out of all of the different sanitation systems that existed both the toilets and also the waste that's already lying in the drainage network um, under different climatic conditions next slide and then of course we were able to use that to estimate what the what the concentration of fecal waste would be in different catchments um, we then used that information to drive um, a dynamic model that would show us how risk of exposure would change over time. Next slide, please. So there's lots and lots of layers to this model, a bit like uh, what Ben was describing. One thing that's very interesting is that from a health point of view, surprisingly, the biggest risks are actually at the upstream end of the catchment, and that is because of dilution. So although we thought a lot of the problems would be at the lowest lying areas, they're actually not necessarily at the lowest lying areas in this particular catchment. What we were also able to do was to uh, test the model to see what different intervention strategies might do to reduce uh, hazard, health hazard and also total nutrient flows. If we go to the next slide, um, these are some inter oh sorry, these were our disease plots. So we were essentially able to use this to look at what were the probable changes in risk of infection from various uh, common enteric pathogens, which is useful if you want to make the economic case for improving the management of sanitation. But if we go to the next slide, we were then able to look at what different interventions would do to reduce the hazard. Now, from a health point of view, interestingly, um, the biggest bulk of fecal waste that gets washed out in these floods is actually already in the drainage network. So from a nutrient point of view, uh, making sure that the drains, that there isn't informal dumping and that the drains aren't full of fecal waste is really important in terms of reducing nutrient flow to the lake. But from a health point of view, um, the most important thing is to reduce the direct connections between the sanitation systems and the drainage channels. So we're able to test these different outcomes using the model, which was really interesting. Taking all of this, which was a lot to take in, I've got a couple of take homes from this study. If we go to the next slide, um, essentially, uh, we're really saying that there is significant fecal waste which gets mobilized in these flood events. And we've seen in particularly this year, we see these increasing intense, sharp rainfall events. And particularly when they when they come after a dry spell, we get this big washout effect of the existing sanitation system. 
Um, most of the nutrient load that gets washed out is already in the drainage network. And um, the most significant interventions are really about making sure that we are moving the fecal sludge out of the low lying areas as quickly as we can formalizing emptying so going right back to what Nishta said at the beginning trying to really eliminate this informal dumping into the drainage network creating incentives for fecal waste to be moved to treatment and as Elizabeth just pointed out you know perhaps looking even into the opportunities of finding particularly as we reinvest in sanitation systems thinking about ways of optimizing those on-site systems looking at opportunities for resource separation at production point. If I had one single message from all of this, and it's very boring, and those of you that hear me talking will hear me say this all the time, I don't personally believe that we need, we can't say that one particular technology is better than another for, this, for these types of problems. I think what, what Elizabeth's pulling out, what you hear from Ben and from all my colleagues is that we really need to think about sanitation as dynamic and needing really active and dynamic management. So we're moving the fecal waste and the nutrients and the pathogens out of the way of where humans are, making sure that we're interrupting these flows that are going into oceans, and particularly as the climate changes, protecting those, those systems from shock. Uh, back to you, Martin. Thanks so much, Barbara. Fascinating and important findings. And, and for, thanks for your pragmatic system management conclusions that you've drawn from them, as well as a, these critical links to climate change, rain events, the reality of urban dynamics. Yeah, that's great. And I like the idea of dynamic sanitation. That's one I'll be using. Thank you. Right, we're going to move straight on to our panel discussion with the speakers. But to kick it off, I'm very happy to introduce a former colleague, Kirsten Olsen. Kirsten is an associate professor of ecological economics with the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Management at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, where she employs methods from both the natural and the social sciences in her research program focusing on reciprocal relationships between humans and ecosystems to inform management and policy. She teaches environmental policy analysis, environmental evaluation, social ecological systems. She's held posts with the World Bank, Blue Ventures Conservation. She's affiliated scholar with the Stanford Center on Ethics and Society, a postdoc teaching fellow at Stanford's Public Policy Program, and a National Science Foundation International Research Fellow in Madagascar. She has degrees in civil and environmental engineering, a master's in implied environmental economics and a PhD in environment and resources. I'm just exhausted reading that out, Kirsten. So firstly, <laughs> thank, thank you for joining us so early in the morning for you in Hawaii. Could you tell us a little bit about the impact of inadequate sanitation on marine health and related challenges where you were living and your efforts to identify, map and address these challenges, plus those other dimensions of cultural sensitivity, social behaviours and norms. There's a lot that, you, that you've been looking at there. How yeah, I think, reflect, I mean, yeah, reflecting on what you've heard today. Thank you. Yeah, I think a lot of people have talked about different dimensions, um, but uh, I guess the reality in Hawaii is that uh, it's not what it seems. Um, sanitation is a critical issue here. We have uh, uh, leaking sewer pipes. We have cesspools across the islands. We have um, over 90,000 cesspools in our islands. Um, and the geological characteristics of Hawaii are such that the, whatever happens on land is quickly, sh uh, quickly shows up in our aquifers and our coasts. Um, we uh, live in and from the ocean. Um, the ocean is, in, is culturally significant. Um, and so anything that degrades the, the nearshore environment or threatens our drinking water, threatens our food and water security. Um, and unfortunately, improving sanitation is a really expensive problem that is often um, the costs of which are borne by those in society least able to pay it. So the cesspools in Hawaii are in rural and, and predominantly native Hawaiian communities. Um, and the, the, the ability to do um, any sort of centralized treatment is limited. The ability of those communities to pay for um, cesspool upgrades is limited. And so solutions like we were just talking about, about keeping um, nutrients um, within the system, separating uh, uh, gray water and black water um, are, are important uh, possibilities. The problem, of course, is that there are regulatory barriers to those that need to be resolved, right? Um, so uh, I'm an ecological economist and decision scientist, um, and you know I use data and models and, and, and create data models like we just heard to help support decision making. 
So, you know, in, in Hawaii, we've done a lot of work on um, mapping areas of anthropogenic stressors, just like Ben was talking about. Um, we uh, build models to look at how land and marine management will impact ecological uh, functions of the nearshore environment and, and what that means for the ecosystem goods and services that um, are delivered to people. Uh, with the aim of informing, for instance, marine spatial planning or watershed management um, to, to focus on the main stressors to the nearshore environment. Um, but I want to focus on a specific case um, where we used a, a, a decision analysis uh, framework called structured decision making to help an upcountry com a, a community in upcountry Maui uh, hone in on good solutions to cesspools. So the uh, there are about um, 10, 12,000 homes on the eastern slope of Haleakala Crater on the island of Maui um, that the DOH has targeted for cesspool upgrades. Um, they, they're worried about the impact in this case on the aquifer uh, and drinking water supply. Um, but the homeowners are worried about the cost and more fundamentally, they even questioned whether cesspools were the problem. They, they pointed fingers at agriculture, they pointed fingers at um, natural sources of nitrogen in the drinking water. Um, so what we did was we gathered a diverse group of stakeholders and through a year long process, we hashed out what really was the problem. We uh, defined what the objectives were, um, what they valued, and then we built bespoke models to help them understand how different alternatives that they identified would perform. Um, and this sort of process was very inclusive. It was inclusive of different worldviews and different values. Um, and it uh, brought people together so that when we confronted trade-offs across the alternatives and objectives at the end, they may not have gotten everything they wanted, but they understood what, uh, why, right? They understood um, what they were giving up and what others were gaining. And I think three, you know, three insights from this sort of uh, inclusive participatory process um, could help us move forward. Um, you know, first, that decisions need to be based on good data, but it's important to understand what data are needed to inform decisions, right? We as researchers and scientists love to create information, um, but we need to understand what information will help decision makers reduce uncertainty and make better decisions. Um, secondly, a, a, a process like the structured decision-making process could be a framework for meaningful stakeholder engagement. Right? Often we have the engineers and planners at the table and we kind of think about the problem like that, but bringing in the um, cultural practitioners, the ranchers, the farmers, the hippies, um, you know, everybody who lives on Maui um, really had, uh, it expanded our problem definition. It, 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 it provoked systems thinking, right? Um, and it, it ensured that we hit on a lot of different social development objectives, not just the get waste away from people um, and treat it, right? Um, moreover, I think the transparency and the feeling of being heard uh, can really improve buy-in um, and when people don't get everything that they want, right? Um, so yeah, I think you know, we had success because we asked people to interrogate the way they define the problem, um, how they, how and why they valued the things that they said they valued, and why they thought their solution, like they, I will all come in the door with a with a preferred solution, like why they thought that one was the best. Um, yeah, so in short, Hawaii faces the same issues as what we've all um, been talking about, um, and we as a community um, and and have our work cut out for us to use information in strategic ways to. Um, improve sanitation um, and achieve broader development goals um, and to conceive of sanitation as kind of the the nexus the integral part of um, this broader agriculture coastal human system music to my ears kirsten to hear uh, <laughs> sanitation at the heart of it and that's so it's so fascinating to hear this reality from from what you're working on in Hawaii, and it, it resonates so much with what we're working uh, on in, in developing country contexts as well. I'm, I'm sure you're aware from your previous work, you know, the whole thing about structured decision making, systems thinking, that's great. And if any of the others want to comment on anything to do with the regulatory or any of those issues that, that Kirsten raised, that would be great. I'm going to quickly ask a, a round of questions about how important is data and what can we do to get data 
to the right people. Ben, do you want to um, mention that? You've, ben and Barbara have, have thought a lot about this, I know. Yeah, just briefly, I mean, as Barbara pointed out, and I hope I showed as well, like data, the quality of the data that go into it really drive the ability for these models to show you where things are happening and where our strategic points of action lie. And so the better that we can collect data, but importantly, share data, the better that we as scientists can inform management decisions. So as government agencies and, and scientists as well, gather data, make it available, and then that allows us to really um, leverage it to make our work even better. So data, maybe it's a tr truism, but data is fundamentally important for helping solve these problems. Barbara, any thoughts? Are you, uh, data's been very important for your work. You're muted. Barbara, you're muted. Sorry, rookie error, first one of the week. Um, I, I think just to say, I absolutely agree data is important, but I, I do think that sometimes as development agencies and in the international community, we can be a little bit sort of hand ringy about data. We need more data, we say. Uh, there's two things I would say that are important. One is that there is a huge amount of data which isn't being used. So I don't think we should just rush out and say more data. I think one of the things is really to support and help people to use the data which is available. Um, and, that, and then that sort of leads me to my second point, which is that you do need skills to use data in smart ways. So I really feel like it's important when we think about the next generation of training and education. I mean, for my engineers, I feel like they're 50% technicians and 50% data scientists now. And I do think that, that that's really important. So. Yeah, I, I think it's critical, but I think a lot of the data we need is probably there or can be assembled more easily than we think, but we need to kind of commit to do it, I think. Right. Any more thoughts on yeah. data for many of you? I just wanted Stephanie. to add um, quickly, I agree. I, I think that there are probably some data gaps here that do need to be filled because there's some areas that have really been understudied. But I want to emphasize what Barbara is saying about people using it. We have all kinds of monitoring programs in the marine space that just collect data that sits on a shelf. Part of that is because people don't analyze it or even know how to interpret it. And so when we're creating new tools and putting new data out there, we need to either do it ourselves or partner with another organization or individual that's better at this at laying out the guidelines. What do you do with this data? How do you interpret it? What does it mean and what actions get taken? We can't assume that if we provide data that um, people are gonna know what to do with it. They often have no clue. They need more steps to understand. And so those kinds of systems need to be built in to whatever we're doing when we're providing data. And I see that Kirsten saying in the chat box that she sees a critical role of knowledge networks and boundary organizations in getting data to the right decision makers. So. Excellent. Right. I'm going to throw out another question to you all about shifting the narrative and working across sectors, which I think this panel represents as well. But often when we talk about marine pollution, we, we the focus is often not on well-managed sanitation. It, it may well be on plastics, which is very important. But how do we realign the narrative with the environment and the ecology sectors, as well as within the sanitation sector to change this? Who should we be targeting? How do we work more collaboratory, collaboratively? collaboratively across the sectors who'd like to take that first i mean stephanie you're doing that with your with your let's yeah. go to ben and then stephanie because you you ben you have you a really you quick that. comment that i think wastewater has a really important role in connecting human health and environmental health it's not the only issue that does that but it definitely is something that brings a lot of different stakeholders together and solving the problem actually needs to have all those stakeholders together because the solutions will have different consequences for the environment and for people. So it's, it's a, a really important issue that I think people have focused on the human health side of it, but there's, as Stephanie and others have shown, really important environmental consequences of this and, and wastewater is powerful in connecting those. And we need to make sure as well, thanks Ben, that about our terminology between sectors as well, because wastewater is, is very important, but it is part of the problem as we heard as well. There's on-site sanitation systems that create pollution. And so this issue of sanitation and the terminology is really important, especially as we start working with other, with other sector professionals. Does anyone else, Stephanie and yeah. then Barbara? Um, yeah, I think Ben pointing out um, human health is really important. And I think there are so what I've learned as I've dove into this world is there are tons of intersections with human well-being, not just human health. There are all kinds of 
economic factors here, gender equity issues, social justice issues. There are a lot of, this is a very complex beast. It's wonderful and scary all at once. And so there, are, I feel like there are lots of ways where we can find alignment. We have a lot of shared goals with other sectors that play a role in solving the problem. Um, and as you point out, Martin, terminology has been a big one. We just put out a resource for practitioners in the conservation space to learn about sanitation. These, This is a threat that they have to deal with, but they don't know anything about it. They don't know who's managing it. They don't know about the technology. They don't know any of the terms. We had a whole discussion of wastewater versus sewage and what, what's the difference there, right? So um, terminology is extremely important when sectors are going to work together. And I think, you know, um, Kirsten gave a really great example of how you do this. You bring in, you're inclusive, you bring in folks from, and this has going to happen often on the local scale, but you bring in folks from different perspectives and have different interests to find that common ground together to figure it out so that everybody understands better something that we like to just flush and forget. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Barbara, you wanted to add something. Just a quick point, just reflecting. So historically, sadly, I'm old enough, and so are you, Martin, to have been trained as environmental health engineers, or in fact, I'm a public health engineer, which is a very old fashioned thing that doesn't seem to exist anymore. And, and the sector, the sector, the sort of wash sector was carved out of that environmental health space because I think in the 80s, what was recognized is that what was being left out was the attention to making sure that people at the end of the pipe got service. So the MDGs represented in some way a shift to make sure that we were actually giving people services and not just focusing on the wastewater system or the whatever, fecal management system and the drainage and all of that. I think now we can see the shortfall of that has made the sector very sort of narrow and focused and siloed and it's lost all those connections. So we definitely need to move back. But I think the real challenge is not to lose what we gained in the MDG period, which was to ensure we've got to do both things. We've got to protect the big public health space, and we've got to ensure that individuals have really high quality services to secure their safety and their development. And I think that's the next move that we have to make. And it's a big, big sea change that we have to achieve. And I, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's a comment from Kelly Trott that does wastewater have a branding problem. I'd say that sanitation has a branding problem. Which, for me, sanitation is a solution. Wastewater is the thing that we're, we're working with uh, as our other parts of excreta related pollution. Um, thanks for that. There, there's a question as well. I'm going to throw it out there and, and see if anyone has a thought on it. Should fertilizers not um, that provide um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium be priced to reflect the damage they do? And another way of looking at that is what you've been doing, Elizabeth, in, in, in trying to keep the fertilizers on the, on, on the land. I don't know if you have a, some thoughts on that because you've been doing economic analysis of these things as well. Oh yes, thank you. I haven't done it personally myself, but I think I think it's not it's not actually the 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 value of the nitrogen and phosphorus in in our wastewater that is going to make this run. It's more what you protect uh, by keeping it out from the waters. That's where you get get the big gains. Um, but yes, there there we have in I've been in projects where we've done very interesting cost benefit analysis of these systems that I'm talking about, source separation in urban areas. I would just like to build on what we talked about, um, changing the narrative. And I so what's been important for us, it's exactly what people are saying. You, the utilities we're working with um, need to work upstream and downstream their jurisdiction, basically, because we need to change the system. If you're going to have source separating um, wastewater system in urban areas, you know, it, urban planning needs to change city development needs to change and you have a set of customers in the other end that uh, with with your heat and your biogas and your nutrients and your water and you need to work um, integrated with all of these uh, sectors and it's not necessarily very very simple to do that because you're kind of challenging um, a very um, a very powerful setting with the conventional system so if you try and do this sort of separation you're incurring costs in one end for the utility, for example, but the, the, the society as a whole is gaining hugely on doing these systems. So the utility doesn't, doesn't necessarily want to carry that cost for society's development. So you need to have decision-making on very high level, kind of pointing down to the utility and saying, you're going to do this and the city development as well. So that's very important, I think. 
Thanks, Elizabeth. Right, I'm going to, I'm conscious that we have five minutes and I know that they cut us off. So one, two, three, four, five of you, I'm going to give you all a minute at the end to say either what do you think is the biggest blockage or more importantly, what's the one thing that we should start doing differently next week to start addressing this big problem? Before I come to that, while you're thinking about it, and I'll go around each of you, um, there's a nice comment from Kate Medlicott um, and saying that sadly many people don't in the chat don't care much about safe sanitation beyond their own toilet or about water pollution except when it affects them directly which is so true and the WHO um, where she's leading the sanitation um, work uh, has recently published updated guidelines on recreational water quality for fresh and coastal water and she's got a link there to that so thanks for that there's more in the chat that I haven't been able to keep on top of but thanks for all that. And, and I, I'm going to ask the presenters to go in before they log off and, and answer some questions if they can, because it's captured then. So let me do the round. I'll start with Kirsten. What's the one thing that is, what's the inhibitor? Or if you'd rather, what's the one thing you'd like us to start doing differently next week? Yeah, I, I guess I would say, let's think of sanitation as a multi-objective problem, not a single objective problem, right? That would be my... Brilliant, love that. Thank you, Kirsten. Ben. Well, she sort of stole my point. I would just say, like, I think because it's a multi-sector, the solutions are not quite as straightforward, but are really important because you can get trade-offs between the, the human health and the environmental health outcomes and being aware of that. Building on that awareness to find solutions that are win-win for both of those sides is critically important. Fantastic. Elizabeth. Uh, I would say challenge the conservativeness in our sector to think that when it needs to be conventional gravity fed sewers and a treatment plant in the end, challenge that on Monday morning <laughs> and think reuse, not treatment and take it from there. Excellent. Thank you, Elizabeth. Stephanie. Um, I think this is going to sound very basic, but I think we just need to be talking about this more. It's in, in, in my world it's still taboo, it's still thought of something other or so thought of something as solved. I've gotten in arguments with big, you know, I call them nitrogen gurus um, of the world that very much believe this is a solved problem. And um, that our real problem is agriculture and very like zero appreciation of how much this is not a solved problem. So I would say talking about it, talking about it to everybody, sharing the things you're learning, get more curious about it, when I speak to general public audiences, I ask them to find out how their waste is being managed because so much of this is about us not understanding the system or assuming it's taken care of. We're not gonna get people to help us until they understand it's actually a problem. That's great, Stephanie. Not only is it not solved, it is intimately linked as we've heard today, agriculture and what we're trying to do here. Yes. So that's the, we need to keep making those points, Barbara. I'm really tempted to take direct action. I'd love to collect a day's worth of the production of wastewater from the city of London and go dump it on Downing Street. Honestly, I think until we do that, the problem is always invisible. And I think the same thing in developing countries, you know, there's all this, keep this shit in the slums because we don't want to dirty the river. It's like, let's show people the scale of this problem. I mean, maybe I shouldn't say that, but you know, I'm old enough to take the risk. If anyone wants to join me, I kind of feel like we need a, you know, a, 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 a little subset of Extinction Rebellion specifically on this topic. Barbara, I'd love to join you on that for so many reasons, uh, not, not least of which um, the, the, the excellent, excellent um, point that would make. Thank you for that. Right, we've got a minute to go. This has been fantastic. I want to thank the co-convener organisations, the excellent presenters, the audience for joining in. This is clearly a topic for the world's water ecology environments for which it's key that the different state stakeholders listen to each other. We've been hearing that throughout today, that we learn from each other and we work with each other. So many of us here have actually been working directly or indirectly on this nexus of issues for many years and others are new to the theme, but clearly there's still much to be done as we come together to address these momentous challenges that we've heard of, about today. So find out more, look at what WHO are doing, the World Bank, Ocean Sewage Alliance, all of these, you know, these great organizations and let's get together and let's address this, you know, it, with the United Front and sanitation at the heart of it all. I'm very happy with that. Thank you all and to be continued. <laughs>